Hi everyone, Steve the Amateur Historian with a story uh, that goes outside of the state of Oregon for once. This is the story about, not so much the story, but more the mystique and mystery of a man who vanished at a very suspicious time, leading people to draw numerous possible theoretical conclusions about what happened to this man going up against uh, other, at least logical, inferences about what happened. This is a story of a man who was directly related to a much more well-known figure, a figure who had a lot of people around him that he kind of led along. Uh, a name that is probably very familiar to you, the name Charles Manson. But this video, more specifically, is about a guy that even if you've looked into the Manson family, as they're known, Manson and all of his followers, who, um, you know, iconically went on trial in 1970 after this string of murders in the summer of 1969. Even if you've looked at this case a little bit, the name of the man I'm going to talk about in this video may still be unknown to you. I'm talking about a California attorney named Ronald Hughes. Steve the Amateur Historian. Ronald Hughes and his relation to Charles Manson and his infamous family is kind of interesting. Now, uh, you know, everyone at least knows a little bit about Charles Manson. Essentially, this is a guy who spent more than half of the first 30 plus years of his life in prisons, reformatories, uh, juvenile establishments. This guy was committing crimes before most kids learned multiplication. And in about 1966, he gets out of prison and he makes his way to the San Francisco area. And very slowly, he starts attracting predominantly women to him that start following him. A lot of these women are fairly young. A lot of them were kind of at a crossroads in their lives. A lot of them were from either broken homes or homes where they didn't feel particularly happy. A lot of them were runaways. A lot of them had practiced in the use of drugs. Some of them had petty criminal records in their past. These were people who were still very young and struggling to find a purpose and thus easy to manipulate. And Manson pretty much worked his crooked charm on a lot of these people. Again, mostly women. There were some men that he drew in. And you know, one person at a time, he began um, developing followers. But more people just kind of started traveling with him. You know, kind of one person at a time. And what started with one woman, Mary Bruner, in the kind of San Francisco area, just kind of more and more and eventually became, you know at least a few dozen uh, people, and they'd kind of bounce all around, predominantly the LA area. And it's known that they engaged in all kinds of crazy stuff. There was orgy, orgies, excessive LSD use, and people were really mesmerized by Charles Manson, and he had this control over people, a control that wasn't really understood at the time. And it became a necessity when Charles Manson and three, ultimately four, um, Tex Watson, another guy who 
um, came along later and was charged independently of Manson and three women who were involved in these infamous murders they engaged in. And it became necessary to show that in that trial that these, you know, Charles Manson didn't kill any of the people that they went on trial for. He probably killed at least a few people. He's known to have at least attempted to murder a couple. But it had to be proven in order to get Manson convicted along with the girls that he controlled them and therefore shared in the responsibility of these murders. And it seems like he used a combination of, uh, you know, maybe hypnosis, a lot of drug use, and just, you know, uh, I don't want to say a uh, creative or charismatic way with words, but he knew how to manipulate these people. And what seemed to start off as kind of almost this kind of love commune traveling around Southern California started to get kind of dark and Charles Manson started becoming obsessed with this concept of Helter Skelter based on the... Well, the Beatles did a song called Helter Skelter that he derived the name from. And he felt that the Beatles and him had this cosmic connection and that the Beatles' White Album was entirely about Helter Skelter, which Charles Manson conceived of as this major war wherein essentially the black people were going to become fed up of the dominance that white people had had over them for, you know, pretty much the majority of human history. And they were going to start fighting back and it was going to become this massive race war that the black population was going to win. And in his horribly racist perspective, Manson thought that once the black population defeated the whites and Manson and his family would be hiding during this so they would survive the war, you know, because their commune was entirely white people. Manson's perspective was because black people haven't had control the way white people have, they wouldn't know how to control, how to deal with it once they had it, so they would have to rely on Manson to show the way, so Manson would essentially become the king of humanity, or whatever was left of it. That's, you know, in essence what his idea of Helder Skelter was, and who knows if he honestly believed this. This could have been a power trip on his part, it could have just been some sadistic fantasy, maybe he was crazy enough to honestly think this was a real thing, or that he could make this happen, because it seems the objective of these murders they committed, or at least his motivation that he gave to his followers to motivate them to commit these murders was they were going to kill these white people, make it look like black people did it, that would create this, you know, collision between the blacks and whites, and it would start Helter Skelter, the race war. Um, that's what his followers uh, truly believed, and he got four... Um, Four of his followers together told him to go out to a house uh, up in the uh, canyons. I, um, I'm not, I can't remember exactly which canyon it is, I'm sorry, but kind of, you know, north of Hollywood, kind of up by where, like, Mulholland Drive is. Um, it may have been Laurel Canyon, I think. But anyway, they went up there to this house that multiple celebrities had lived in, and Roman Polanski famous film director and his wife Sharon Tate were currently living in this big house that Charles Manson told them to go to. And while Roman Polanski was gone, there were three other people in the house, and Tex Watson, who I mentioned earlier, who, uh, while they were away from Manson, seems to be the person that was kind of coordinating things, he went with Linda Kasabian, Susan Atkins, and Patricia Krenwinkel, two family, or three family members, and they, well, Minus Linda, who waited in the car, and um, by her own account, which has never wavered, she didn't know what they were planning. She thought they were just going to creepy crawl, which is where they would sneak into people's houses and move furniture around just to freak people out. And then she was shocked to see that they had shown up to brutally murder these people. And the following night, this is August 1969, they pick out another house that... Uh, middle-aged couple, Lino and Rosemary LaBianca, lived in. And Manson actually was involved in this one. He went in and tied the couple up and then went back out and he had, um, I want to say there was only three family members that went in because I think it was Tex and Patricia. And then on this night, Leslie Van Houten, another family member went in and they murdered that couple. 
So it took forever. They, they couldn't figure out who did these cases. They were so crazy. They were so brutal. It was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. And it was happening in L.A. And, you know, in the case of uh, Sharon Tate, you know, Roman Polanski's wife, they thought that that was a, a drug deal gone wrong. And it was just, it took forever before they finally figured out. Um, Susan Atkins essentially just started talking about it. And that got to the authorities' attention. And so... Susan Atkins, um, Patricia Cronwinkle, Leslie and Van Houten were the three women that went on trial. Linda Kasabian ended up uh, getting immunity in exchange for her testimony against the family. And then Charles Manson was tried with the three girls. And in March, late March 1971, they were all, um, they'd been previously found guilty. It was the longest and most expensive trial, I think, at least in California history, maybe in American history. And then March 29th was when they were given their sentence, which they were all sentenced to the death penalty. And then in 1972, uh, less than, you know, a, a year later, uh, California deemed the death penalty unconstitutional. So those four individuals had their sentences com um, changed to life sentences, which actually made them eligible for parole as early as 1978, which I guarantee scared the shit out of a lot of people. Um, and none of them uh, obviously were ever paroled. Susan Atkins died about 10 years ago. Charles Manson obviously died a little over a year ago. Patricia Quenwinkle and Leslie Van Houten are both still alive and still in prison. And honestly, probably an unpopular opinion, but I feel like they should have been released a long time ago. And my main reason for this is I think it's pretty obvious these were not cold-blooded killers. And in the context of, you know, the rule of law, the fact of the matter is uh, Vincent Bugliosi, the prosecuting attorney, his whole, you know, defense, the defense that was accepted in thus convicting these four people was that Charles Manson, through use of verbal manipulation, hypnosis, drugs, whatever, he completely took over the minds of these people and controlled them like robots. Thus, he was charged with them even though he didn't kill any of these victims. So, I don't see how you can make the claim, even all these years later, that Patricia Krenwinkel and Leslie Van Houten, and maybe even Susan Atkins, even though Susan Atkins, based on what I've seen, was a pretty screwed up person. Um, but in the case of Krenwinkel and Van Houten, I feel like it's kind of crazy to say these women killed, but they killed because they were completely controlled and manipulated almost like robots, entities independent of their own minds by control through Charles Manson. And that was essentially the, def uh, the prosecuting argument that was accepted in convicting these people. But then you try to argue that these women should never be released from prison and they're cold-blooded killers and they knew exactly what they were doing. And it's like, well, which way is it? Are they cold-blooded killers that will kill the moment they get out of prison? They're just naturally killers? Or were they people who killed because their minds were being controlled? You know, I don't see how you can argue that they're cold-blooded killers when they were sentenced for being controlled and manipulated into murder. I just, I don't think they're cold-blooded cold -blooded murders, and I honestly think, I think obviously they needed to serve pretty decent sentences. They did commit murder, but I think after about 20 years, personally, they probably should have been paroled. But what I'm getting at with all this Manson stuff is the same day that these uh, death penalty sentences are brought down for Manson, Krenwig, Van Houten, and Atkins, and then later on, uh, Tex was convicted as well. But the day that these four were convicted, that same day, the body of attorney Ronald Hughes was discovered in rural Ventura County. It had, was severely, um, it had obviously been out there in the wilderness for a long time. It was badly decomposed. Parts of his body were missing, presumably made off with by animals. Um, and he had been missing for, I believe, I want to say over four months. But now who was Ronald Hughes? Ronald Hughes was actually brought on to this big trial. He was going to be part of Charles Mance's defense. 
And then ultimately Manson ended up having another attorney and Ronald Hughes ended up defending Leslie Van Houten. And it's interesting that Ronald Hughes went missing before the, the um, trial had completed. And actually that led to, in 1966, Leslie Van Houten was actually retried by herself. It was deemed that she deserved a retrial because her attorney turned up dead before the trial was over and she had to be given a new attorney at the last minute. And she actually, it ended up being, um, I think a hung jury with her first title and she was actually released and wasn't retried till 1978. So for a brief period of time, she actually had been released and was free and didn't kill anybody. But in 1978, she was tried again and once again found guilty and sentenced to life in prison and she's been there ever since. But it's very interesting how Ronald Hughes even became a part of this trial, much less up for consideration to be part of the defense team for Charles Manson, you know, the man who killed the 60s, the most f hated man in America, you know, I guess before Richard Nixon pretty much became that a few years later. But I mean, this is a guy that struck fear into a whole city of, you know, few million people. Um, by his power and his actions in these cold-blooded murders. Ronald Hughes had never done a case of this nature. He had barely any experience to his credit. He'd actually failed the bar a few times before finally passing and getting to actually become a practicing lawyer. And this guy had barely any experience. And yet here he is, <laughs> the, the trial of the century almost, the Manson family, and he falls right into it and he ends up being defense for one of the women who was involved in these murders. Uh, granted, Leslie Van Houten was the least involved. Um, she, uh, pretty much her only involvement was she stabbed Rosemary uh, LaBianca a few times after she was already dead. So, you know, the most you can say is she, you know, brutalized an already dead corpse, um, so to speak. And Ronald Hughes was a fairly outspoken guy, and he was not your run-of-the-mill attorney, you know, especially in the 1960s. You know, it is the era of hippies and so and so and so, but, you know, practicing attorneys in a court of law are usually the polar opposite, at least appearance-wise, from, you know, those you know, that were wandering around Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco and the Flower Children and the Summer of Love, 1967. You know, they had short hair, business suits, clean cut. You wanted to have that clean cut look because you were appealing to a trial jury that you wanted to like you and respect you and trust you. And here's Ronald Hughes, this kind of balding guy with this big fluff of hair on his head and this big, huge beard. I mean, he almost looked like a homeless person. Uh, but he didn't really let it bother him. He was very outspoken and he actually, over the course of this trial, became kind of Charles Manson, one of Charles Manson's biggest adversaries in this trial. And the objective was Manson wanted the girls, he was trying to control the trial because he already had control over these women and he was trying to get them to ultimately just come out and say, we did this on our own independently. Charles Manson had nothing to do with it. It was all on us. Because of course, Charles Manson wanted to get off and he didn't really care about any of these people. He was on trial facing another rap that would probably put him in prison for the rest of his life, as it did. And he just wanted to throw these women under the bus so he could, you know, remain free. And of course, Linda Kasabian, a former family member, comes back and she ends up being the star witness for the prosecution against these Manson family members. And then magically these stories start coming out about how, oh, well, these crimes were all Linda Kasabian's idea in the first place. And essentially another member of their family had been in jail um, for another murder. And Linda Kasabian came up with this idea that they should commit these copycat crimes to show that this member of their family wasn't really the killer and the real killer was on the loose. You know, pretty much the family tried to throw Linda Kasabian under the bus. Um, but this was a place of contention because these were practicing attorneys that were defending um, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and of course Hughes defending Van Houten. And they obviously could see what was going on and they did their best to prevent their clients from just flat out just doing whatever Charles Manson told him to do. And Ronald Hughes was the most outspoken in this vein. And it hit a peak when uh, pushing the end of the trial, 
um, before they were going to go into the final stretch, the final arguments, the final say, and then the jury uh, goes into their quarters and decides whether these people are guilty or not. And the three girls and Manson went into an... Uh, I mean, they, they've been constantly creating distractions all throughout the trial, but they really lost it when the attorneys for these three women all said that they rested their case and they didn't put any of the women on the stand because they wanted to go on the stand so they could say, hey, Charles Manson had nothing to do with it. We did this on our own, but without putting him on the stand, they couldn't say that, so they did the next best thing. They stood up and started yelling about how they wanted to testify and saying, you know, trying to make their case without actually going on to the stand. And, you know, they were removed from the courtroom. I mean, what else are you going to do? And Ronald Hughes, like, very loudly was like, I'm not going to follow this crap. I'm not going to actively, as it was quoted, I'm not going to just push my client out a window. You know, I'm not going to put her on the stand so she can literally manipulate herself into taking responsibility for something that you, Mr. Manson, you know, put into her head. Um, so there was a lot of animosity focused on Ronald Hughes by Manson and, you know, other family members. And it was reported that, um, you know, after the defense rests and the face family members had to be removed from the courtroom, the judge decided to have a 10 day recess, giving everybody a chance to kind of just take a breath and then come back to do their final statements. And on this last day, um, Charles Manson reportedly said to Ronald Hughes, like, I don't ever want to see you in this courtroom again, or words to that effect. Which is very suspicious because it's late November. The trial is, they're supposed to reconvene November 30th, 1970 to finish. November 26th, Ronald Hughes, you know, this scruffy guy that knows a lot about the hippie culture, decides to cut loose and to go camping with a few friends of his. So they leave, they go out to the area of, um, I hope I'm saying this right, Sespa, Sespe, hold on. S-E-S-P-E, -S -E, Sespa, Hot Springs, guessing that's what it's called, um, in rural Ventura County. And it's November and there's a lot some rain comes in. There's a lot of flash flooding and the vehicle they're traveling in gets stuck in the mud and his two friends decide to uh, kind of head out of there on foot. But Ronald Hughes decides to stay behind. He wants to stay for a couple of days and he says he's going to take off out of there November 28th. Well, he's last seen, I want to say, the morning of November 28th by some other campers in the area. He's by himself, they spoke for a little bit. He seemed just fine. It seemed like nobody was, you know, there was no cause for concern. And then the trial goes to reconvene two days later and Ronald Hughes is nowhere to be found. And, uh, you know, numerous searches were done of this area, the whole area where he had been camping. And there were actually tips that did come in that said to search the Barker Ranch. Barker Ranch was one of multiple kind of rural, just east of LA places where the family had been staying. They're most notably known for staying at Spawn Ranch, which was an old uh, west. It was essentially, uh, you know, an open space where they had an old west type setup where they would film old western movies there. It was essentially a falling apart movie set by that point. But they'd also stayed at a place even more desolate, getting off into the hills, heading up towards uh, Death Valley that was called Barker Ranch. And the family had been staying there and they had gotten um, suggestions to go search that area. So it seemed pretty clear out of the gate that people thought the family was directly involved in Ronald Hughes' disappearance because of all these things that were going on. They hated him. They wanted him removed. Manson and him you know, almost came to butting heads a few times. And you didn't do that with Charles Manson at that time with all these family members on the loose that would do anything for this guy. And then, yeah, it ends up not being till the end of March that he's finally discovered uh, several miles from where he was last seen in the general area that he was camping in. 
And to this day, the murder of Ronald Hughes, which happened back in presumably the end of 1970, it's been almost 50 years. It is still an unsolved cold case. And with pretty good reason, he was, again, so horribly decomposed. He was so decomposed that when they did his autopsy, they couldn't even determine a cause of death. Now, you know, a lot of times that can leave, you know, a real violent cause of death just unknown just because of the circumstances surrounding the corpse's state when it's found. Um, but it can also represent um, kind of unexpected possibilities such as, you know, a death happening at such a convenient time um, and yet maybe it was just an accident. He was discovered essentially wedged between um, some like boulders on a gorge. Um, but it's always been suspected. The main theory in this case has always been that members of the Manson family murdered Ronald Hughes as a form of retaliation for, you know, the way he was behaving in court. He was going against the man, Manson. And um, there were lots, I'm actually going to do another video on this. There were lots of random murders that happened between 1968 and 1970 that potentially have connections to the Manson family that were all murders that even by the mid-1970s, were all cold cases. They hadn't been solved. Um, and of course, independently of the seven murders that these four members, the Manson family, were tried for, it's known that they were involved in the murder of a guy named Gary Hinman. Uh, even before that, they're known to be tied to that. And in another case, there was a guy named Bernard Crow that Manson had infamously shot, you know, attempted to kill him, and Bernard Crow faked dead, and Manson assumed he killed him, and then suddenly Bernard Crow was brought in as a prosecution witness, and Manson had no idea the guy was alive, and they just suddenly encountered each other, you know, in the halls of the courthouse, and Manson all of a sudden was just like, and uh, in a film uh, that I saw on the thing, apparently Manson just looked at him and said, hey, no hard feelings. That's apparently what he said to this guy that he tried to kill. Um, but what I'm getting at is it's known that the Manson family had no qualms about killing people and that even when Manson was in jail, there was still the potential that people were being murdered. There was, in one particular case, there was a guy that went by the name of Zero who was a known family member who, in November, I think of 1970, so, you know, after, you know, the trial's already going on, he shot himself playing Russian roulette with a fully loaded gun. That's the story that the Manson family members who were in the house with him say. Um, and then the gun had been wiped of prints. And it was pretty obvious that this guy had been murdered for whatever reason, probably by members of the family who were all in this house with him when he did it. So the biggest you know, ongoing theory is that some members of the family likely you know, on Manson's orders, he called out to some of his followers who weren't actually in jail being charged with anything to go find Ronald Hughes and kill him off and, you know, to make a point. You don't go against me. You don't go against my family. Um, and that, that theory rose to prominence primarily because it was referenced in Vincent Bugliosi, who again was the prosecuting attorney in that case, who wrote the infamous book Helter Skelter about the case. And I want to say um, he really brought that theory to prominence. Um, and he didn't say, you know, beyond any certainty that the Manson family was responsible for Hughes's death, but that he was very suspicious. The timing, the motives that Manson would have had to kill him off. And that's still kind of the theory that holds true today. That being said, it is believed by many that this was legitimately, you know, coincidental timing still, but that this was an accident. And that Hughes, again, you know, there was flash flooding going on. Uh, it's possible that Hughes, you know, by himself could have gotten mixed up. He could have got hit by unexpected water. 
whatever circumstances might have happened out there, and he could have been, you know, sucked underwater and drowned and was washed ashore somewhere. Again, it's one of the problems of not being able to determine a specific cause of death. But it also kind of suggests that maybe it was something more natural. You know, it wasn't him getting stabbed 40, 50, 60 times like, you know, some of the victims of the Manson family. It wasn't getting shot multiple times. You, there, there would probably be evidence of that, even on a seriously decomposed body. I've heard cases of bones found 40, 50 years after crimes were committed and they could still identify, you know, gunshot wounds and things of that nature. And even Ed Sanders, who wrote a really good book on the Manson family called The Family, which is really great because it goes a lot more into all of like seedy organizations that Manson was mixed up with and the family was mixed up with. And it goes into a lot more stuff that kind of gets lost in the spectacle that was the murders that they committed. And Ed Sanders was reportedly a friend of Ronald Hughes, and even he believes that he likely died as a result of accidental drowning. So there is that side. And as much as I'd like to say those damn Manson family sons of bitches killed Ronald Hughes, I kind of, the more I think about it, lean towards the idea that this was probably accidental. Or if he was killed, he maybe stumbled on to some, you know, who knows, redneck up in the hills, but that it wasn't that wouldn't necessarily have been the Manson family. And it's, you know, there's, there's lots of logical reasons for that. One, you know, he was still in town in LA for days after the trial had been put on this 10 day recess. Cause again, he didn't leave till about, you know, four days before the trial was going to reconvene. So he was in LA for more than a week where members of the family could have gotten to him a lot easier than trying to track him down up in, you know, rural Ventura County. And he was with friends. They would have had to kill his friend. They would have likely killed his friends as well if they were tracking with them. I mean, this is a family that didn't, they weren't, you know, if they were planning on killing one person, it wasn't like they were too concerned about killing others. You know, in the case of the, uh, Tate murders. There was a fifth victim they killed, a guy named Stephen Parent, who literally was there briefly visiting the guy that was the caretaker of the home who claims he didn't hear any of the murders, even though he was in a house right next to where the murders were happening. But, you know, I don't think that guy's involved in any way or anything. It's just kind of strange. And Stephen Parent had just been visiting, to, visiting him, um, asking if he wanted to buy a clock radio. And the guy that was watching over the place, which by the way, just a side note, in the 1970s Helter Skelter miniseries, um, this guy that was watching over Tate's house as Stephen Parent was visiting, he was named uh, William Gerritsen. The guy that plays Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite plays that guy in the movie, only he's like 17 years old. Anyway, um, and Stephen Parent just happened to be leaving when Tex Watson and the girl showed up and Tex walked right up to the car and shot Stephen Parent, even though he wasn't even really related to anybody that was there at the house, but it was just, he was a potential witness. He was another guy there. So had they tracked with Hughes, they likely would have killed his friends right there with him. There's, you know, there's no evidence that any, you know, member of the Manson family that was free during this time, that they were in the area that Ronald Hughes was in. So, you know, the theory that a, a member or multiple members killed Ronald Hughes is really just more of a, a fun theory, but it seems uh, kind of far-fetched, you know, that they would wait till it's the hardest thing, way possible. You know, they have to go up into the hills and track with him and deal with his flash flood and whatnot and then kill him and try to get out of there. Um, it seems like a, a really stupid time, not that, you know... The members of this family were particularly smart during this time. They were either just dumb in general or they were, you know, a lot of them were on drugs and a lot of them were just kind of messed up in the head during that time. But it just doesn't seem like a logical uh, time to go after this guy and kill him. And again, there's no, there's no evidence against the family, you know, physical or, you know, eyewitness accounts of family members in the vicinity where Ronald Hughes was last seen. Um, and unfortunately, there's no evidence against anybody else. The last time he was seen was by some other campers, and he was by himself. 
So you almost kind of have to think that this guy probably just met with a horrible, tragic accident that took his life. And it just happened to occur right at the end of the trial that these Manson family members were on. And I think, again, even if you uh, know a bit about the Manson family and about Charles Manson's background and the background of the family, um, a lot of people that know about the family and their history don't necessarily know as much about the people that were involved in the trial. And I think it, it's kind of a forgotten, wild piece of history that one of the attorneys for one of the Manson family members who was on trial for these, you know, horribly violent but yet iconic murders vanished without a trace while the trial was still going on and was later discovered dead, potentially at the hands of the Manson family. But as I've given you my opinion, I'm about 75, 80% of the opinion that it was either an accident or if it was foul play of some kind. They said they saw no signs of foul play, but again, he was so horribly decomposed by the time he was found that possible foul play signs might not be noticeable. But if he met with foul play of some kind, I would think it was more just he ran into the wrong person up in the wilderness, up there, if he was murdered at all. Probably not the Manson family. But I thought that was such a such a wild piece of history and something that a lot of people don't know about. So I thought it'd be really something good to do a video about. And I want to do some more videos about the Manson family. You know, I just, I kind of knew a little bit about them. It was interesting history. And then, you know, back in like 2007, I sat down and started reading Helter Skelter one morning and I finished the whole book in a day and I was like hooked. Um, and now I know a lot more about it, but I want to do, I want to do videos about these other murder cases that the Manson family is thought to be involved in and, you know, the information behind that. I really want to delve into, I want to do a video about Charles Manson's, uh, analysis of the lyrics of Beatles songs and how he took these lyrics that they wrote and convinced his family members that they were actually in reference to the Helter Skelter War and that a lot of the lyrics were them talking to Charles specifically and all that crazy stuff, because that's something else that pe people kind of know. Yeah, there was a Charles Manson Beatles thing, but I really want to go in depth into the lyrics and how any normal person would read them and how Charles Manson interpreted them and then presented that to his family. So I want to definitely do more videos in regards to the Manson family, but I thought this would be a really good place to start because, again, it's kind of forgotten history. So anyway, guys, all that said, that's a wrap for my first video talking about the Manson family. And uh, thank you so much if you made it to the end. You're a real trooper. And uh, as everybody on YouTube asks, remember to like, share my content if you so choose. And subscribe. Please subscribe so you know when I'm posting new stuff. And hit up my Patreon if you want to help me financially and be a real hero in my life. The link is in the description below, as is the case with everybody on YouTube who wants money. And uh, all that said, guys, till next time, this has been Steve, the Amateur Historian.